All right, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah, sweet. That's good. It's nice to know it's working. OK, so um, thank you for all coming along, first of all. Um, lovely day in Falmouth. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, what we do at Cord Rivers, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story with uh, not a lot of evidence after Linda's talk, so that, that was good. Um, but hopefully I can um, convince you all that the way we do and what we do at Cord Rivers is, is a good approach. It's a way that allows us to deliver software um, quickly and sort of effectively, and that makes most of our clients pretty happy um, that we do deliver the way we do. Um, so I've got a three-step plan for today. First of all, I'm going to tell you who I am and why I'm up here talking. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a, lot of, uh, a little bit about the fundamentals of um, continuous delivery and what it means, um, take you through some ideas if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then I'm going to show you, as we go through, how we actually implement those ideas at CodeRivers and some of the systems and ideas. Um, I'll even try a live demo um, if the VPN holds out, um, but we'll see. Hopefully it does. So a little bit about me. Um, you may have noticed I'm not from around here. Um, I am some, some northern fella that's made his way all the way down here. He's far too hot um, from beyond the wall. Oh, it's Game of Thrones. Anyway. Um, so I, I've worked at a few different companies. Um, so I started at Imagination Technologies once I graduated. Um, that was about as south as I've ever worked. Uh, worked there for a little while. I had to quickly retreat um, back to the Midlands. Uh, that's about as south as I think I could bring myself to get. And I worked at a company called Capula. I'm pretty sure there's at least one Capula person in here. Um, there you are. There you go. Um, um, I then moved on to a company called Premier Software. Um, before moving to Stas Uni, um, lecturing software engineering and computer games programming. And um, what's quite interesting is that most of these companies, except for the university, and um, we delivered software sort of iteratively, but quite sort of slowly, I guess. Um, we'd release, we'd version our software, and we'd release it every now and again. Um, there'd be a guy sat there somewhere that would do the builds, um, and he might have some problems, and he'd have to come and bug me, and I'd have to try and remember what I did three weeks ago, and turns out I missed a file, and the commit I didn't write some documentation correctly somewhere. Um, and then I went to university, did some lecturing there, but we didn't really, we were more focused on teaching people how to program rather than teaching people how to deliver software. But arriving at Codebus, um, it was quite eye-opening, really, in the way they've implemented continuous delivery, um, the way it works for them, and the way they've actually got some incredibly big brands on board um, in a system that, on the face of it, looks pretty unsafe. Um, but when you dig in a little bit deeper, actually works really well. So... Forgot to click. There we go. So delivering software, it's probably the reason you probably most of you here is because you find it tricky. It's troublesome. Okay, when you go down the manual sort of routes where you've got a build master or whatever he wants to call himself, you you end up with a process that's quite prone to error. It's quite manually intensive. His job is to do the builds. Okay, you've got to employ someone to do that. Um, it also takes the ownership away from the developer that actually worked on that feature, whatever it might be, to actually deliver it. It goes, he throws it over the wall to someone else, and then eventually maybe it goes through testing, and then it comes back to him six months later, and he, he genuinely can't remember what he did or how he even wrote code like that six months ago, because he's come on a long way since then. So what I'm going to hopefully take you through today is, is a few ideas and, and tips and tricks on how you can reduce that risk and eliminate all that tedious, repetitive work that no one really likes to do. That guy you've got doing the build probably doesn't really enjoy his job, and he's probably a miserable bugger. Um, and also to increase confidence in the delivery of your software. So every time you do want to deliver something new, you can trust that that process will work um, every single time, and Mr. Buildmaster won't make any errors. Um, so some of the brands that we have, that we work with, um, you may have heard of one or two of them. In fact, you may drive one or two of these brands of car. Um, so Alphabet um, are a big part of the BMW group, are a, a leasing company, um, lease out to businesses. Um, BMW, Mini, um, Honda, Volvo, Toyota, Lexus, Peugeot, Citroen, some rather big names there. Um, there's also some really big dealerships as well. Um, you may have bought a used car from some of these, such as Carbase or Robinson Day, maybe Trust Ford or Sitna. Um, and then there's some big finance companies as well, such as Close Brothers, who are big in the um, car world, and Black Horse, um, part of the Lloyds banking group. So again, lots, lots of big names on there. And we can deliver software to these guys um, very quickly, and in a way that's very safe. So hopefully that's what I'm going to tell you about. So 
What we're going to start with, however, is to wake you all up. I'm going to make you all stand up, because I hope this first question you can all answer true to. Okay, so if you can safely, being the key word, and trust, you can trust what you've done, implement a feature from your client that maybe only is one line of code that needs changing, okay? It might be quite a serious line, it might be a, a mathematical formula, and suddenly one client needs that number to be twice as big as every other client. So you have a if BMW number times two, okay, in your code base somewhere. Um, if you can deploy that safely within six months and get it out to BMW, stand up. Please all stand up. So you're really doing. Wow. Interesting. There's a few people still sat down. Cool. If you could do it in three months, if you can't sit down, that's good. Some of you are doing it a little bit right. What about one month? Do it in under a month? Good. Go. One or two people have just dropped, pondering whether they could safely deploy a change to a, a large corporation like BMW. What about a week? Yeah, I thought so. So you're probably maybe doing Scrum or something, and you've settled on a two-week iteration cycle. It's quite common. Um, but it still means you only deliver at the end of every sprint, right? You do a build, or you sign off one of the builds, one that the continuous integration servers ran, and then you, you deliver that. What about a day? Can any of you change some code and deliver it in a day? Oh, it's starting to drop now. It's good to see some of you are already doing this, or at least something along these lines. What about an hour? I'm not sat down yet. What about 30 minutes? You know what's great news is there's two other code reviews in this room and they're still standing up. Yay, there you are. What about 15 minutes? I think we're, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like squatting now. I'm, I might sit down. I think that's roughly where we're at. Um, it's lower? No, roughly about there? 10 minutes, yeah? Pretty good. If you can build and release in that time frame, you're doing it right. So well done. Um, so we probably do it in about 15 minutes, roughly speaking. It depends what part of our tier you probably want to deliver, which application you want to. Some are a little bit slower, some are really quick. Um, but it's pretty nice to see that if someone rings up, there's a bug, I can get a fix in, and in, once I've obviously programmed the fix, I can then get that out pretty quickly. So what this is known as is your cycle time. And I'm going to come on to that a little bit more later. And I'm going to actually tell you what our current cycle time is from commit to live um, in a little bit. So what you're going to want to do, and what hopefully I'm going to help you do today, is lower that cycle time. I'm going to try and help you get that as low as possible for your business and still be able to do it safely. And the real key thing that you've got to be able to do here is automate. You've got to get rid of that guy. You don't have to get rid of him. You can give him a new job or something, same fire him. But um, you can't have any manual processes, really, in your build process. If you do, you're not going to ever do it in 15 minutes. Okay? Poor guy is going to be well busy, just constantly bashing. You see, he can't do it. So but if we automate this process, what it hopefully could give us is something that's reliable, something we can trust, that every time I change a piece of code, I can use that automated process to deliver that code through our pipeline and out to live. And it will be a change that is there that our customers can use very, very quickly. Okay? So things like versioning, um, so like version 1.1 of our software, things like that, they don't exist. Okay? We're just continuously iterating on our software platform. Okay? We've got an architecture. It's a software-oriented architecture. There's lots of different applications knocking about um, that our front-end applications call through an API layer, effectively. We're using C Sharp and ASP.NET. And to give you an idea of some of the text, we're not doing this with anything weird, right? We're using pretty standard industry stuff these days. Um, so we're definitely a .NET dev house. All our backend tier is all done in .NET. Um, we use tools like Visual Studio, and we use ASP, um, MVC, and Web API 2 um, to build our APIs. Um, we're using database technologies like SQL Server and, and Cassandra and Postgres, we're trying to move away from SQL Server. It's a little bit expensive. Um, and then on the front end, we're also using technologies like Angular and native JavaScript and tooling, again, like PHP Storm and 
We've got spec floor tests, and we're using N units to run our tests. One thing you might notice is missing off there that freaks everyone out is we don't use Git. Um, we use, still use Subversion, and we still use Subversion for a reason, and I'll talk to you about that um, very soon. We also have Selenium down in the corner over here running more automated tests. Um, they, that tests the browser, so basically it runs around the browser clicking buttons. Um, it's pretty flaky, but um, it does occasionally catch some issues that we otherwise wouldn't have wanted to get into production. Um, we've got other tools to help our developers out, things like Ncrunch is pretty cool. It continuously runs your tests as you write your code. Um, so there's loads of little dots down the side of Visual Studio that are red or green. And as I write my code, in about four seconds, it gives me some feedback as to whether I've just failed a test as I'm typing my code. Um, and that's pretty nifty. Um, and when we do a lot of our build scripts, they're all written in Nant up there. Again, pretty retro, but we know how to use it. It works. It's reliable. It's exactly what we need. And again, even the CI and continuous delivery platform we use is not even in development anymore, is cruisecontrol.net. Okay? But again, we've customized it. We've forked it a little bit. Um, and we've run with that to effectively give us what we need to continuously deliver our software in a reliable sort of way. Now, all of this is underpinned by the need to do, uh, well, forget my highlighting, um, they need to do continuous integration. And this really is a foundation, foundation joke, oh, mm, of everything um, that I'm going to talk about, really. Okay? And that is the only Mac you'll ever see in one of my presentations. So it's vital to get that right first. Okay? You've got to be able to do CI. And I don't want to talk about CI too much, but that is effectively every time you commit a piece of code, okay, one of your developers commits a piece of code, a server somewhere will make sure that that builds correctly. Okay? Hopefully, it will also run all of the tests as well. That's quite an important part of this. So it'll take all your unit tests that you've written. It'll take your Selenium tests that you've written, so those browser automation tests. And it'll run through them all, any other integration tests, any tests you want to write to make sure that your piece of software does what it should do and that you haven't regressed. Okay? Um, now, this is the first step in our deployment pipeline. This is what gets done. You commit your code. A little thing appears on the screen, which I'll show you soon. And it shows that you have built, you've passed all the tests, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of how it works. We've committed to our source control. Now, I mentioned we used Subversion earlier, um, which probably freaked all the like, hipster developers out there in the room, um, because we, we, don't use, we don't use Git. Um, and I think the reason, well, another reason we don't use this is because we don't want any long-living branches in our code base. Okay? Your commits should be super small. Okay? Git doesn't help there at all. We all work from a centralized location. Okay? So it makes sense to have a centralized source control repository. So we all commit into the same trunk. We have one trunk. Okay? There's one master branch. There's nothing else going on. We all commit into it. We instantly all run about our tests. So we haven't got anyone running off with 50 local git commits, and then he eventually pushes to the master, and it maybe doesn't have any merge conflicts. Okay? I've worked at Coderoos now for about a year and a half. I've never merged once. Okay? That's how small our commits are. Our core base is quite big, so we're all often working in different areas, but we very rarely have any merge conflicts. Okay? And that's all down to the fact we commit very, very frequently. Now, if you don't believe me how often we commit, um, we've got some stats. Um, I don't know if you can see those. Um, we, we track sort of, we, everyone has their initials in our system. So when you commit, you commit under your initials. Um, so it's relatively anonymous. The two guys in the room might be able to spot themselves on here. Hopefully, they're at the top. They're actually not. They're here. There you go. Not too bad. At least you're on the screen. Um, so you can see this is a week. This is a one-week slice that I've taken here from our stats thing. And you can see that DS uh, committed 54 times this week, um, or last week. As a matter of fact, I actually took these screenshots um, on Tuesday, I think. Um, so they were from the week before. So that's over 10 times a day he, he committed, which is pretty frequent in a seven and a half hour working day. It's more than once an hour. I'd love it if everyone committed once every five minutes. It's a little bit unrealistic. Um, and you can see average is probably around 20 or so. Um, it also tracks when people break it, and we don't blame people for this. It's not like a, a blame thing. It just lets you track it and feel good or bad about yourself. Um, and you can see that certain people um, break it quite a lot. 
and other people um, don't break it at all, but maybe they are just doing more risky changes. If you look at it over six months, um, you can see that JD up there committed 886 times in six months. Okay, so we, he's been doing this a long time. Um, you can definitely tell the guys that work in the front end because they've added like 14,000 node module files and 9,000 node module files, and the back end guys have just like changed a few files. Um, the, the column I like the best is the deleted column. The higher this is, the better you are doing as a developer at our company. The more code you delete from our code base, the better. That's the way I like to um, lead. So who's winning right now with 472 deleted files is, is BG, but there you go. Um, so once you've committed and you commit frequently, like I said, um, that automatic build then kicks off. What it then does is run all the tests, okay? All those automated tests, and it's really important to have a solid test suite. It doesn't have to all be done by TDD. I'm not some purist, um, but everything you do should have some unit tests around it. And you should probably aim for a relatively high coverage, and I think coverage does matter. And then once that's built, if the build was successful and you've passed all the tests and it's integrated with the rest of the code, et cetera, et cetera, um, then it will then automatically, in our case, deploy to our staging environments. Okay? So all of our URLs have demo before them, and you can go to those to check your code does what you expect it to do once it's actually on a production environment. We also have all of our dev machines running Windows Server um, 2012. Um, so they are pretty much identical to our server, okay? our server stack. So they're as close as possible. Um, it reduces any of those weird DLL issues you get as you do this like deployment pipeline sort of thing where it works on your dev machine and then after the build it suddenly doesn't work when we try and deploy it because there's a missing DLL or something. It catches us real early if there is anything like that. So a few essentials for us when it comes to committing and working in the CI world. Um, we're unable to commit when the build is broken. It's pretty extreme um, and it definitely slows us down. All right. However, it also means we don't have like this huge pileup of crap as people just keep committing because no one cares the build's broken. All right, so I see a lot of articles um, where people are like, oh, continuous delivery is rubbish, or continuous uh, CI doesn't really work because when the build breaks, which is the thing it's supposed to do, everyone just keeps working anyway. And maybe a couple of days later, someone will go and try and fix why the, the thing on GitHub's gone red and it's not green anymore. Um, so what we do is you can't actually commit. So you try and commit, subversion pops up and says the build is broken. Um, it's currently red, and you can't commit. Um, so this means the entire company, all the devs at least, um, are very invested in getting that build green very quickly. Okay, so we all come together. We've got a very collaborative feel at Codebus, um, where we all sort of band together when there's a problem, and we try and fix it really quickly. Sometimes it does mean there's 10 guys stood around one PC staring at the guy that's broken the build, but hopefully occasionally they offer a, a helpful solution that helps us fix um, the problem. You should always run all the tests on your local machine before committing. Um, you'll be amazed how many times that doesn't happen. Um, but it's very embarrassing when you break the build and it's quite clear you haven't run the tests. Um, so I think quite quickly people learn to run the test before they commit. You only make that mistake once. Um, you should never really go home on a broken build. We try and have that ethos in our, in our company. Um, and that might sound really evil, like we're all going to have to stay till 7 o'clock to fix the build. But really, there's a revert button, and you click it, and all your code disappears, and it hopefully goes green again. Um, try not to comment out failing tests. Pretty important. But you'll be amazed at how many people try it on. Um, and then you catch them, and then you sort of mm, quick swift back. No, we don't. I'm not. Um, but it also always basically means that you end up taking responsibility, OK? You have broken the build. Your initials pop up on the screen. Okay, It's your problem, or your team, or uh, whoever you're pairing with, because we advocate pair programming quite a lot. Um, and it, it means that we know who to go to. We can help them implement a fix. It brings us together. It's not a blame culture. Okay, It might sound like it when you see the screen. It might look like it, particularly if someone's broken the build when I alt-tab in a minute. Um, but it really because of the feel of what we've got and the sort of culture we sort of have at Codebus, it actually brings us together to work together, to fix these things, to learn from each other. Okay, it's really important that that's what we do. So what happens? That's a little bit small, so let's zoom in. Um, so this is what happens on our CI, um, something along these lines anyway. It changes all the time, and that's to make it faster, smoother, quicker. When we find bottlenecks and problems, we try and um, get those to work a little bit better. So um, the build starts, we've done a commit, and we check the files that are included. Um, so we work out which application to build. 
Okay, there's a number of different apps in our sort of pipeline, and we work out which one the current commit impacts. Okay, and we then build that application. So it could go into the back end build, um, the C sharp build, or like the front end build, which is now Gulp, not Grunt. Slightly old slide there, um, and then we run all of our tests. So from the we run all the unit tests for that application that we've just committed to, um, and then we also wrote, we also then warm up the applications on the box, so we sort of get them up in the IS. And then we run all our integration tests. Um, what we've recently found is that Selenium has been a bit of an issue for us um, in terms of actually being reliable, um, which is quite important in this, um, in this scenario. Um, so what we've done, um, just to give you a, an idea, is we have mocked out our service layer. Okay, So we've built a thing, and we've called it Mock Platform. And what it does. Um, is when Selenium runs the first time in the day, it hits the live service tier, and it caches all the responses. Okay, And then for the rest of the day, it runs all the Selenium tests against those cached responses. All right, And this has made the service tests that run using Selenium much more reliable. Because if the back end changes, which maybe could affect like the data, we're having lots of data issues. You know, Like the customers imported some new data, and suddenly the Selenium test breaks because we're trying to find an Audi A1 in the drop down, and his data's crap, and Audi A1s have disappeared for some reason. Um, and that breaks the build, and we don't want that. So now we mock out our services, which has worked really well so far. Um, so we run the Selenium tests, and then we prepare for deploy. We copy it to a folder, and then that kicks off a deploy to our demo, demo or staging environment, um, which copies all the files out of that releases folder and drops them into the right place on the production or staging production environment. And that takes us about four minutes um, per application um, that builds. Okay. Now, because we build per app, um, so we've got, I don't know how many apps we've got, probably about, let's say we've got 20. We've probably got a bit more than that. Um, what it means is your commit is probably in that four minute window, the only commit in the application. Okay? So you'll probably build by yourself. What we used to do before we built per app, we used to build our entire tier, which had its advantages. Okay, because you ran all the unit tests, you didn't just run the test for the app, and you occasionally caught some other things. It did make the build time longer. It got up to about 10 minutes, which is why we decided to split it down into per application. Um, but it it didn't quite give us the right feedback. Okay, it took too long to work out who brought the build because when there's a 10 minute window between builds, you ended up with like three or four people being in each commit. And when it broke, we had to go and work out which of those four people actually broke the build. So breaking it down, having your build really fast is really important. When you commit 54 times a week, there's going to be lots of people ending up in the same build. Okay, So you've got to be able to have a quick build so there's fewer commits in each build, else it takes too long to work out. Now, if it breaks and it takes an hour to work out who broke it, and no one can commit for an hour, that's a pretty big block. So what it does is it gives us really early feedback. And this is important. All the way through this pipeline that I'm going to talk you through, it gives us really quick feedback. Um, test coverage should be high. Um, I love I am for 75%. Realistically, most apps are somewhere between 50 and probably 80, um, somewhere along those lines. Most of them are around 50, 60. Um, some things can't really be tested, or there's no point testing. But um, if it breaks, we can't continue. Okay? Prevents any defects, get into production. And gives us that quick feedback loop. What's really important here is every single commit we make can be released into production. Okay? This means you've got to write your code, or you've got to get your developers, if you're not a coder, to write in a certain way so that every commit they do can go to production. And that means there might actually be no way of getting to that code yet. There's no root in. There's no, there's no top-level API to get into that bit of the code base yet. Um, or maybe you've got to do something like a feature toggle. So the, we've got another system that lets us do feature toggles live. Um, and what it'll ultimately lead to is a higher quality code. So you've got to think more about what you're delivering. You can't just hack stuff in and think, I'll fix it tomorrow, and then commit it. And you just can't do that anymore. It, it stops you being able to do that, because it's going to go to production. Even if you don't deploy it to production, someone else will probably deploy that application to production today. So your change is going out with it. So you've got to make sure what you do is safe increases code quality straight away. I talked a little bit about this already. I won't um, spend too much time on it. But if we can contrast here what I've been talking about so far, where that automation 
just through the CI part, now onto the deployment part, we've already started to get an appreciation that things are going to work. All the tests have passed. It's built. It's deployed to staging. Um, so this, this build guy, he doesn't have that like release day where he's crapping his pants because of how many files he's going to have to like, merge into the master trunk from the dev trunk or whatever he's doing. Um, all the product owners and product managers aren't freaking out because that build up to release day is proper tense and they are worried something's going to go right. It's going to be a bit of a car crash. And it can be very time consuming. Okay? It can take hours um, for, the, for the build to be prepared. So the alternative really now is to automate these deploys. And the only human element here is to pick or to click the button that says deploy to live. Okay? And that's there just because you should really probably have a quick gander at it on the staging environment to make sure it does work. Okay? Test coverage, unit tests, all those things, they don't guarantee it's going to actually work, just that the code does what you wrote the test to say. And then maybe like QA are involved at some stage. Um, we do have a QA team. And we're not one of those like dev-only test things. We try and have QA to ensure the quality is there, hopefully from the very start of the process, not just at the very end. So this leads me on now to what continuous delivery is. Um, and it, it's really, it's not just the way we deploy, OK? This is what I'm getting at today. It's actually the way we run our business, OK? It's essential. We sell ourselves to our clients based on the fact we use continuous delivery and what this allows us to give them, OK? And the way we can deploy changes and software to them. So every commit should be deployable. So we deploy them, OK? It's your job as a developer to get it out to live. When I show you the screen in a minute, it's probably going to have lots of red flashing bubbles everywhere and stuff, because people haven't deployed their code fast enough. And that's something that hopefully we can pick up on and improve. Okay, And that's going to lower our cycle time, the thing we're always striving to lower. So here's, here's some more stats. We love stats. Um, so this was last week. Um, it's backwards, because the thing I copy and pasted it off goes up the screen. Um, but on Monday, we did 131 commits. And then on Tuesday, we only did 94. So what this says to me immediately was, on Tuesday, someone brought the build. And he broke it quite badly. And no one could really work out how to fix it. So everyone's commits got a little bit bigger. And that probably created more issues downstream. Okay? And what it ultimately led to was far fewer production deploys per day. Okay? But what this does tell me is on a pretty good day, I've seen this number above 50. Um, we can deploy to production 27 times a day. Okay? Um, and that, that's actually a pretty bad week last week, if I'm honest with you. Um, they are quite low. And it's normally quite a lot higher. Um, Friday's always a weird one. Um, so there were, you'll notice there's 181 deploys onto the staging environment, and only 14 went live. And um, that's because we don't like to deploy on Friday afternoon, because we all like to go home on Friday evening. Um, so we normally have a bit of a build-up on Monday which, again, can help with Monday's numbers. Um, so it can be a little bit of a story in there. So things aren't done until they're released. Okay? We, we try and uh, we use Kanban boards to like, manage our, our pipeline. Okay? So we've got like a, in fact, there's a picture in a minute. Um, but there's a sort of backlog in development, on staging, live. Okay? And thing we can, once they've sort of made it to live, you can effectively just like, throw the cards in the bin, really. Uh, maybe the testing team want to have a quick gander at them first and make sure we're delivering the quality to our clients that they, they expect. Okay? But we class things as only done when they're actually delivering value to the customers. So that is, they're switched on, they're active, they're deployed to production. Um, but again, that happens very, very quickly. So getting rid of that build guy means that everyone, every developer, even non-developers, uh, take ownership of that deployment of their code. Okay? It's your job to get your code to live. Okay? It's part of the developer's job. So everyone takes ownership. Everyone's responsible. Okay? And no one gets to pass the book. No one says, oh, I don't want to deploy that. Um, but it's like it's got your initials against it. You're the other guy that deploys it. That's how it works. Um, and it removes all those barriers. Okay? Sometimes there's like three commits against one app. And you're like, you click and have a look at what has changed. And you're sort of like, that looks a bit scary. But I really need to deploy that app. So what you do is you go and talk to them. You have a conversation with them. And suddenly, you're communicating. And you're finding out what other people are doing. And the visibility can really help around there. So how does it work? How does a developer go from his command board 
to the live environment. And it looks a little something like this. First of all, he has a really crappy looking Kanban board like that um, because it doesn't really matter. Um, make it very physical. We really like to see things out and about in the office, OK? We do have Jira. I think everyone somehow has to subscribe to Jira to be agile or something bizarre. But um, I don't think we really need to use it very often. It's more for like the product owner side of the business, managing their pipelines and stuff. Um, so we call them MMFs, minimum marketable feature. Some people call them MVPs and, and things like that. But I think they're people from Microsoft as well or something. Um, you then write some code, you, you pick your ticket off the board, you move it into production, you start coding away, and you write an if statement or whatever you do. And then you do a very small two file commit, and you write a commit message that's very descriptive and explains what you've done and, and actually helps the next developer that comes along to your code to work out what actually was changed. You don't write any comments because, because comments are pointless. Um, that's an entirely different talk that I could rant on for at least an hour about. Um, and then you commit a code, and CI fires away and starts building your code. You can look at the screen um, to see what's going on. Um, or you can look at cruise control. And again, that'll tell you what is actually going on here. Um, if you're successful, then it will deploy to staging. And that'll take about two minutes to probably get onto the staging environment. We run two servers on staging, um, as opposed to um, four, soon to be eight on live. We sort of horizontally scale rather than having like different boxes for different apps and stuff. Everything's on one big box, effectively. Um, so that'll take about two minutes to get onto demo. You can then have a little play and a little test. Um, and then you go to the same application that you want to deploy, and you click that big button that says Force, and that will send your code to live. And that will go to live right then and there. And what it will do is, let's say there's four boxes on our live environment. It will take box one out of the load balancer. OK, so no web requests will hit box one. It will wait for any existing requests that are currently being processed on box one to finish first. It will then copy your changes from the demo environment onto the live environment. It will then warm back up the box one, so it will start all the applications again. And then it will pop box one back into the load balancer, and then it will move on to box two. Um, it will take box two out, do exactly the same thing, and it'll do three and four. And then once it's done four, it'll then go to the other data center, because we have a, a DR. And then it will do the exact same thing on the other data center, which normally happens very quickly, because there's no pending requests coming in and things like that. And then you're done. Your deploy is out there, and it takes about four minutes. Um, depends on the application. Some applications take a little bit longer to warm up. Um, so the application that holds vehicle data is definitely our slowest and probably takes about 12, 15 minutes to deploy, I think. Um, and that's because it's got huge caches of all the vehicle data, so it's super quick. Um, and then your change is live. OK, there's one of our products. It's a finance calculator. And on most apps, you can get them out pretty quickly. Most of them take a couple of minutes to warm up, or a minute to warm up or so, and then you're good to go. So. I mentioned this screen. And this is what we have on all the walls. It honks and plays songs and does all sorts of things. It had Miley Cyrus Wrecking Ball on for quite a long time when you brought the build. That's now thankfully gone. Um, and that's what it currently looks like right now. It worked. So the build is currently green, which is great. Um, demo is currently, or staging, we call it demo, is currently red. Um, there's a lot of stuff sat on there right now. These are all individual commits. Um, some of them are actually grouped up now. So you can see that BG here has 11 commits to SHO, which is an application called Showroom. Um, Showroom's a front-end application, so it gets more, way more commits um, than most, like little CSS changes or whatever. Services is currently building. Um, it's got about one and a half minutes to go on that build. Um, DM is committed to services. That bubble here, that you can sort of see, will make its way up here. And when it's able to deploy into demo, it will automatically deploy to demo. When demo is red, however, you cannot deploy to production. It blocks that, okay? because that means there's something bad on demo that you don't want getting out to live. And currently, demo is red because at the top, there's logs. Okay? So we have a logging system. If any log occurs in our entire pipeline, then the screen goes red. Okay? It blocks us deploying into that environment. Okay? We're very active against logs. So these are like unhandled exceptions, null reference exceptions, anything along those lines. Sometimes there's an if check if this happens log right now, because this is bad. We didn't expect that to ever happen. Um, and you can see on live, there's a, there's a few logs right now. Um, those will probably get tidied up as the day progresses. Um, live's currently green, because once a log's assigned to a team, we're seeing that sort of been dealt with. We know about it. We don't want to get blocked too much. Um, so the screen goes green and allows us to deploy into that environment, even with logs. Um, you might want to consider, however, like for instance, Allium right now up there is currently got like, what, 31 logs. Um, so you might want to talk to the team that's currently working on that or the, the initials that are assigned to those logs next to it. So DA, A, W, and AB. Um, 
currently working on that. So that's how we currently do it. This is a completely custom tool that we've built. Um, it hooks into a little custom backend that we've built that no one likes working in. And there you go, that build finished. You see it deploying to demo. Um, this stuff stuck on here, um, probably because some environment that it was dependent on was currently red at the time, so it couldn't deploy sort of like the build was red, but another build like finished and it went red or some weird stuff happens sometimes that puts things, gets things a bit stuck. But you can still manually deploy them over to demo um, when the time comes. There's a lot of flashing red bubbles right now, which is real bad. Um, but there you go. That's what you get when you do something live. Um, I'll try and get back to the slideshow. Nope. One of these many tabs. Who knows what PowerPoint's doing? We also have this other monitoring screen like this. Again, another custom tool that we've built. Um, it lets you see these are the four different servers. And the lines represent how many calculations, finance calculations, which is our core thing we do. And um, it's happening per minute. Um, this is like response times to the boxes. So if this gets really spiky, it means our services are very slow to respond. Um, not too bad at the moment. It's probably just one of the boxes being slow. Um, when I took this screenshot, we were doing 9,842 calculations per minute. Um, I've seen it go over. 50,000, um, usually towards the night time, like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, it's our peak, and when no one's in the office, um, which is great for our peak time to be when no one is around, um, but there you go. And our calculation engine is currently calculating 0.49 milliseconds, um, so that is how fast we do a finance calculation, so speed's pretty important. Um, so I said I mentioned our cycle time, um, that's what it currently is, it's currently sat at 4.32 hours, so the average time it takes and this is for 2016, and we only started recording this in 2016. Um, so from a developer commit to live, with all the redness in between and stuff like that, and fixing logs and other meetings and stuff that occasionally pop up before you get time to commit, get it on production, it takes 7.32 hours to get a commit to live, which isn't bad. Um, like I said, I can get one out in 15 minutes if I must, um, if there's a live issue or a bug or something. Um, but general work is taking people about seven and a half hours um, to get their commits out to live. And that's often because they'll do a small commit, they'll do another small commit, they'll let a few of them build up on demo, they'll test the thing on demo that they've been working on, and then they'll push it to live. So what does it give us as a business? Why do we do it? The reason you probably most of you are here. So it allows us to iterate and deliver quickly. Okay? We deliver software, as I said, on average, in seven and a half hours from commit to live. Okay? It's pretty rapid. It allows us to make changes quicker Okay, we have a meeting with our customer. They want something. We can try it out with them. Okay, they suddenly want it to be red instead of blue. I go in, I change it from blue to red, and I ring them back up 20 minutes later, and I say, it's red now, what do you think? Okay, and we can do that. We can work that way. It lets us talk to our clients much more frequently. Okay, they don't just get involved at the end of a two-week sprint to like reorganize the backlog. Okay, they're involved all the time. That's our only use of Jira, really. Um, it's so our customers can like see what they want, what we what we think they want, um, and they have access to that as well. Occasionally, they just edit it randomly, and we don't notice, which is great. Um, it's now read only. Um, it reduces bottlenecks in the pipeline. It does cause some bottlenecks, um, but it reduces that build guy, reduces the huge turnaround time occasionally for getting back to fixing that thing that's gone through testing that comes back around. It all happens very quickly. There's also great visibility of exactly what's going on in the business right now. So I haven't obviously been there for, for a couple of days now. Um, and I looked at that screen, and we call it Gaffer. Um, and I knew yesterday that something terrible had happened on the live environment. Okay? And I don't know what had happened, but there's a lot of logs when I looked. And that's what's caused that big buildup on demo um, that you see this morning, because something happened. Um, and if I was there, I could probably find out more. But it gives great visibility. You can see the other tool with the lines and the graphs again. I sort of can glance at that now, and I know whether our services are healthy. Okay, so that monitoring and that visibility is really, really important. You know, I can see when things are deploying because I see the servers like go offline in like a sort of a stepping stone type thing. And it also allows us to work sustainably. Now, from a developer's point of view, and even a company's point of view, um, our QA guys love this as well. It allows us to achieve sustainable pace. So this basically means when you've got a two, even a two-week sprint cycle or something, or one week, or whatever it is, and what you end up with is release day, inevitably. Okay, So at the beginning of the sprint, there's not much pressure. You're all working away, you know, tootling along, writing some code, whatever, um, talking to the clients, whatever you're doing. And then as you get nearer and nearer release day, the pressure mounts up, mounts up, mounts up, mounts up. 
And then it's release day and you're proper stressed. Everyone's trying to, like, and just before release day, the sales guys are trying to cram stuff in because they know they can't get anything out for two weeks, but they promised that customer that thing that no one's ever developed before. Um, but whatever, we've got to suddenly make it. Um, and then you release it, it's probably a bit of a car crash for a couple of days, maybe things don't work, everything's a bit slower than it was before, we don't understand why, we've got to try and work it out, we get a fix out, maybe we do a hot fix or a patch and then we release that. Um, and then oh, we're all knackered again and we all go off sick or whatever. Um, and then it's the, the journey starts again. But with this continuous delivery, because I deliver my piece of software, I don't know, three times a day or whatever, um, the stress is, is short-lived, okay? If something does go catastrophically wrong, it's a small thing that has changed. It's a small thing that's gone wrong. It's not two weeks, a month, six months worth of work that's just gone in and gone wrong. It's literally an hour's worth of coding that has gone wrong. I can revert it really, really quickly, okay? In fact, I can probably revert it faster by committing it and going through our release pipeline than I can from doing a live revert by copying and pasting the last deploy back on top of the box, okay? In fact, it's safer probably to commit or uncommit my code, effectively or revert my code. But again, occasionally we do break things. I'm not going to lie. This, this process, things do break when there isn't good test coverage around a certain area of the code. We've got some legacy products that live somewhere back there that no one really likes to talk about and is unfortunately called PMS, um, that no one really likes to go near. Um, and that's not very well tested. Okay, so. When you change it, it's pretty risky, but you can fix it quickly if we do break things. And what do our clients get from it? Well, they get a number of things, really. They get quick delivery. They get turnaround times on anything they want, really, um, really quickly. They can see feedback. They can give us feedback really, really quickly. So right now, one of the things we're doing is we're building offer. I don't even know if I can talk about this, but whatever. And we're doing offers websites for a lot of these manufacturers. Um, We've recently live, I can probably talk about this one, is the BMW motorbike offers website. Um, and we are deploying that to a live URL, okay? And they can just look at it whenever they want, okay? And then we have a call with them, they ring up, they send us an email, whatever, and they're like, you know what? I'm not so sure that bit works. And then maybe the day after, like, that'll feed back to a developer and it'll, it'll change it up a little bit. And you can deploy that out, and then they'll be like, oh, yeah, that, I like that idea better now. That you've moved the price over there instead of up there, whatever it might be. Um, the calculation suddenly is wrong or something, or some data goes in that's incorrect. We can, we can change this very quickly. And again, things like database migrations and stuff, these all go through this pipeline. Okay? We have a, a solution that migrates the database by running scripts, and you commit to that, and then you push it through the same pipeline, and it migrates the live database servers and things like that. Okay? Um, so there's a, we're getting a lot from it. They're getting a lot from it. Um, there's huge benefits all around, really. Um, and it's not, but it's not easy to implement. Okay? It can take a lot of organizational change. Um, but it moves you more from that Scrum thing. I don't even know if it really works that well in Scrum. Like CI works in Scrum, but I don't know whether the whole idea is you don't deliver that frequently, right? So we, eight years ago, way before my time, um, we wanted to become agile because we were like just writing things down on like notepads and stuff. Um, and Three guys went to on a Scrum Master's course and paid some money for something, some Agile thing, level one Agile. There you go. That's probably what they got. Um, and then after about three weeks, they realized it wasn't really for them. It didn't really work. And what we've iterated towards is effectively extreme programming. Okay? That's pretty much what we do. If you look at extreme programming, we have architectural spikes. We iterate really quickly. We get quick feedback. Um, we deliver software in very small releases. Um, and that's effectively, if you want to put a methodology to it, where we've ended up. Um, and it allows us to work quickly ourselves. It allows us to have an sustainable pace. It allows our clients to work with us very, very closely, much closer than most of the methodologies or styles of delivery would allow. And I think that's really um, the biggest highlights. Um, so I hope I've told you a nice story. I've shown you some nice tools. And I have given you a flavor for what we, we do at CodeRivers and, and how it works for us. Um, and I'll leave you with, because obviously I used to be a university lecturer, so I can't help myself, but here's some further reading. Um, and that is really the Bible. If you read that, you'll probably notice everything I've talked about today, Jez and Dave mentioned. And if you were here last year, you'd have seen Dave talk as well. Um, and that is really the thing that we've based what we do on. And then we've iterated on that to work more closely with our needs as a business. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. And if there's any questions, I think I've got a minute or two, maybe. But thank you. Cheers.
any questions from anyone? I'll loiter around as well if you don't want to put your hand up. I used to be a university lecturer. I know it's very scary putting your hand up. No? Oh, go on, there you go. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit of a hack, really. We've got two, we've got two different ways. Um, so we have a, a Visual Studio solution um, that builds. Um, and it's like you basically make two files. You make a C-sharp file that runs a .sql script. And um, that's how we migrate our SQL databases. And um, from our NoSQL side of things, um, we cheat a little bit and we write unit tests. Um, and we run the unit tests, and that migrates the database by running the migration unit tests. But they're special ones. They don't run every build. And that's how we migrate Cassandra. Well, you've got to, I guess you've got to, you've got to, all your changes really from database or code have to be, they've got to be sort of continue working. You've got to think about that, okay? You can't take a database offline to do this, okay? So you wrap it up, we wrap it all up in a transaction, and the script you write has got to be safe, okay? It's got to be migratable as such, okay? So you can't suddenly like drop a primary key or a foreign key or something in a table. You might have to create a new table, maybe, okay? Um, you might then have to migrate all the data from one to the other and then drop that, okay? But the code that is on the live server might need to support both directions, okay? And then what you do is you have a feature flag and you toggle it and suddenly you're using the new version rather than the old version, okay? So you've got to think about like the process that your code goes live in. Um, there's a really interesting story um, around, we recently started encrypting um, an extra part, an extra set of data in our database. Um, and it wasn't done in a way where as it deployed across the four boxes, um, it could actually, it, it worked. So basically what happened is, as box one went in and went live, it started encrypting all this data and saving it into the database in encrypted format. But box two, three, and four couldn't yet decrypt it. Okay, so box, box two, three, and four were still live. So they were still trying to read these encrypted keys out of the database, um, but they, they couldn't, so they just started blowing up everywhere. So we had to quickly stop the deploy, take box one offline, revert box one, fix the code so actually we could read the, a read and write unencrypted and encrypted keys. We had to like put a little token inside the key so we could tell whether it was encrypted or not. So we could just like a bit of string, like is it encrypted? And yes, go down this path, I'll go down this path. So you've got to think about those sorts of things, which you know it adds, it adds a little bit of you know onus on you to get it right. Um, but it does increase the quality and like the maintainability of what you do. Ultimately, I think it makes you think more about what you're doing because you've got to care about what you're delivering and how you're actually delivering it. It's not just a big bang. It's much more smaller chunks. Yeah? Cool. Anything else? Yeah? Yes. Um, so we. You make a train and something sensible like you said that it's bad. Yeah, so that we've, got a, yeah, we've got a horrible project called Common. Okay, so the question was here um, what sort of parts build and is, how is it broken down? Um, so there are some core shared libraries across everything. Um, and when they build, we don't deploy those. Um, so if you commit to the common project, which is in everything, um, what happens is that builds, but a little bubble doesn't appear on the screen. What happens is the next deploy of all those applications will take out the common DLL with it. Okay? What we're thinking about doing maybe in the future is moving to like NuGet, like a package management solution, and packaging up our common libraries and versioning those so that like this application uses version 1.1 of the common library and are moving towards that model, which should hopefully be a little bit easier. A bit more webby, JavaScripty, NPM style thing. Uh, but right now, we just take out the common DLL with us as we deploy um, for those shared libraries. Um, but yeah, everything else is broken down as small as we can do. Um, what we do do, however, is our Visual Studio solutions of former app pools on our web server, and that's how we like deploy them. And so it does mean we can't have that many app pools because every one we spin up takes like 200 megabytes of RAM. Um, so we have like limited ones. Some of the, some of the like, Visual Studio solutions are quite big, but we try and break them down into like sub-projects inside the solutions to make them easier to manage and so you can actually see what like namespace you're in correctly and, and things like that. Anything else? Yep, at the back. How often do we roll back from production? How often do we roll back from production? Uh, a couple of times a week. Um, normally there's like so local, when your build fails, we often roll that back quite quickly, like revert your code, because it doesn't get much further on, in the pipeline. 
Live reverts, probably don't do them that often, maybe once a week, um, if you're having like a bad week, but yeah. It's not that frequently, but it does happen. We're not rock stars. Right then, thank you very much. Looks like some people need to run off to their next talk, but um, I'll be here for a little bit longer.